might want to sit down because this is going to be a few minutes, all right? So just so I can see all your eyes, if you don't mind. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Let's let the other guys fill in. Where are my guys? Patty. Go. Let's go. Where are they? Where are they? Yes, go. Let's go. Yes. Where's my head coach? My name is Mark Soto, I'm the Executive Director of the Honor Bowl, and it's an absolute honor to have you and your team in this event. Before we get started, I thought it would be very important that you guys hear the story of the Honor Bowl. There's, this game is more than just a football game. And I'm gonna tell you the story. Back in 2010, I had a US Marine son that was being sent to Afghanistan. What we used to do as mom and dads and as a football coach, I would travel down to Camp Pendleton and I would get the Marines together and my wife and I would, you know, get them drinks and say, go get some. But this deployment was completely different. My son never told me where he was going until this day, which I found really odd because he had multiple deployments before that. And I always knew, but he never told me where he was going on this one. Until that party. He said, Dad, let's take a walk. And he puts his arm around me and he goes, Dad, I want you to know where we're going. And he goes, we're going to this area in the Helmand province of Afghanistan called Sangin. Do yourself a favor, don't Google it. So as a coach and a dad, what do you think I did? I immediately get my phone out and I Google it. I find out that Sangin is one of the worst parts of Afghanistan. This is where the Taliban grew their opium, their weed, to fuel their trade of terrorism. The British Marines had occupied this territory, and what had happened was the British Marines during a four-year period lost over 100 men and almost a thousand wounded, most by getting their legs blown off. This is where my son told me he was going days before he got on that plane to leave. They left for Afghanistan. And my son said when they were landing in the fog of the safety of what was supposed to be their base, they could hear pinging coming off of the helicopter. And they were surrounded by white flags. Now when we think of white flags, what do we think of? Surrender, right? Not to the Taliban. The Taliban would put these white sheets on the ground and with spray paint, with spray paint, death to the Americans, death to the infidels. That's you and I. They landed at their farm. They got acclimated under all of that pressure. And the first patrol goes out. They go out, they get around a mile down the road, and they hear this boom! Oh my God, what happened to the patrol? The radio, guys, guys, you okay? Nothing's coming back. The Marines load up, they leave the base to go see what happened to that patrol that just left. When they arrive, they're under enemy sniper fire. The Marines that were in that Humvee ran over a bomb that was electronically detonated. It was so big that it lifted the Humvee off the ground twisted it like a corkscrew, and four Marines were instantly killed. This is where it gets strange. I'm in Sacramento, California. I'm a football coach just like these coaches. My son's at war, and I get a call from a neighbor up the street. Coach, something happened next door to our neighbors. Something happened. There's Marines that showed up, and there was, there was screaming, and, and, and it's not good. I think something happened to their son. I end up finding out who their son was. Their son was Victor Dew. He played football for me. I had no idea he had become a Marine. I get a hold of the parents. Is there anything I can do? My son's in the military. I can help you. They, they're on their way to get their son's body. 
and they said, you know, some coach, just help us with the media, help us. It's, it's a, lot of, a lot going on right now. They bring their body home, the son's body home, flag drape coffin, and they asked me to eulogize their son. It was an honor that I will never forget. I get emotional every time I talk about it. We helped bury Victor. I saw him lowered into the ground. I heard taps. As a football coach, I had to do something. But this is where it even gets weird. I get a phone call from Afghanistan. And when a satellite call would come from Afghanistan, it would be <laughs> cracking. And it's my son on the other line. Son, son, are you okay? What's going on? Why are you crawling? He goes, Dad, Dad. My colonel says that there was a coach that eulogized Victor Do. Was that you, Coach Dad? Was that you? I said, yes, son. I helped eulogize Victor Do. He goes, Dad, I was there. I was the first vehicle out of the sea. I cut him. As a coach, it changed my life. It changed it instantly. Thousands and thousands of miles away. And we're bonded. I had to do something to get back. And that's when a friend of mine, Rick Sutter, who your coaches all know, Patty Schumacher, who's a gold star mom, the CEO of our nonprofit, her son was Victor Dew. We all came together and said, what can we do? What can we do to raise money for these guys to help them? They're coming home with no legs. And that's when we started the Honor Ball. What you guys are in, this game, is much more than a football game. This is through the spirit of your athleticism, you're giving back. By your fans buying tickets, by you guys being involved in this game, tweeting it out, this is your way of saying thank you to the men, women, that have bled and died for our freedom. I want you guys to know the story. You guys go out there and play your hearts out. Now I want you to meet a 3-5 Marine that was there. Let's give it up for County Sergeant Frank. All right, good morning. Uh, thank you. Just like you heard the story, third time, fifth Marines, my first time that I was with when I joined the Marine Corps. From Tucson, Arizona, I joined the Marine Corps in 2006, and I knew for a long time that I wanted to be a Marine. When I was in high school playing sports just like you, I knew this is the uniform that I wanted to wear. So thank you for what you do, for playing, for remembering and honoring those that have gone before us, even before my time that have gone before us. Because we get to do what we do because of those that have gone before us. So I want to share a quick story with you from that deployment that I hold near and dear to my heart that's going to help you hopefully, and reach you when you're facing adversity, when you're facing a challenge, when you're facing a roadblock to get through it. So I'm gonna fast forward to that deployment, December 2010, December 30th, 2010. Same thing, there was a squad out on patrol, and if you've ever watched the movie Lone Survivor with Marcus Luttrell, they're up at the, at the mountaintop, they're overseeing the village, and what that looks like, that's what Afghanistan's saying, and saying Afghanistan looked like. Mud huts, dirt roads, dirt, dirt uh, alleys, that's exactly what it looks like. So when I'm telling you the story, hopefully you can picture it. So this patrol of Marines, 20 Marines, were out December 30th, and they were out for about four or five hours, gathering information, intel, talking to the local nationals, and they're making their way back to the patrol base, to the PB, the safe spot where they, they, they hung out at, they lived out of. So after about four hours on their way back, the end of the squad, the back of that patrol, stepped on an IED, and it provides explosive device. Thankfully, that roadside bomb didn't go off all the way. One of the Marines that stepped on it, his foot shattered, broken foot, put him in a truck, got him back inside the base, put him in the truck, got him in a helicopter, get him back stateside where he recovered. Now, the bomb did not go off all the way, so the Marines were still responsible to go out there and blow the rest of that bomb in place so the Taliban wouldn't go pick it up and reuse it all. So after the squad went back inside the patrol base, four Marines went out with the stick of demolition, C4, placed it on the ground, and were getting ready to blow it. 
as they're getting ready to pull the cord, the Taliban opens up from one of those mud hut villages. They open up with machine guns. Three of the Marines run one direction to get cover. One of the Marines standing over the bomb that's about to pull it. Looks in the direction of the, of the firing, the ambush, and runs towards it, raising up his rifle and suppresses back. He ran that direction because there was a little divot, there was a little wash with the waist size wall where he was going to get behind, take cover, and fire back. Now when he got there, he fell on his back, looked up, and he saw that his bottom half was, was filled with blood. He had been shot twice in the legs. He looks over to the left, here comes one of the team members, one of the four that was out there, one of the threes, running over to him, slides in on his knees, grabs his seatbelt, cut his scissors off, cuts the bottom of his pants off, and he sees blood gushing out. His femoral artery on his left leg had been shot. So immediately he starts placing gauze, places a tourniquet on, straps it, calls the squad that's inside the patrol base for help to bring out a stretcher to carry him out. Meanwhile, the Taliban is still ambushing, still suppressing. A couple minutes later, that squad gets out there with the stretcher. They put the squad leader sergeant on there. They count to three. They're going to pick him up. Everyone's going to fire back as they move their squad leader, the sergeant, back. And they do so. On the count of three, everyone opens up. And they pick up the sergeant, and they start getting him out there. Now, one of the corners that was getting carried one of the Marines I was carrying that sergeant out, the one getting carried out, he puts up his hand and he says to him, his best friend, tell my mom I love her and tell my boys I'm sorry. Holds the hand tight and he says, the last words on the battlefield, tell my mom I love her and tell my boys I'm sorry. So I share that story with you. Let me share the back end of that. They get him in a truck, they get him in a helicopter, they bring him stateside here to San Diego Balboa Hospital where he's laid up in a bed. The doctors tell him, you're losing your leg. Too much nerve damage. You're never going to be able to walk and run again. Your career is over. You're getting a medical retirement. Those are the three things the doctor told him. Now in January 2011. Now that squad here said, I'm, this is what I, I'm going to do for you doctors. I'm going to take this as a challenge. And by the time my squad that saved my life gets back, April 15th, mid-April, at March Air Force Base in our North Pier, that's why they said I'm going to be standing at the bottom of that staircase when that plane lands, and I'm going to hug every single one of my squads, and the next morning I'm going to take them on a little run. And I'm standing in front of you today telling you that the doctors told me that. And at the April 15th, when the squad landed there at the bottom of that staircase, I stood there against all odds. When they told me that I was going to lose my leg, when they told me that my career was over, when they told me that I was never going to be able to run and walk again, and I hugged every single one of those squad members that saved my life. Oh, and by the way, the next day I took them out on a little run. So I share that story with you because it's not just about football where you're going to face adversity. You're not just going to get hit out there. You're not just going to have a bad play. You're not going to have a bad call. It's not just there. It's life, your parents, your relationship, school. When you move forward, college, your career, you're going to face these challenges every single day. You have two options. You can fail at something or be a failure, and there's the difference. You can fail at something, pick yourself back up, dust yourself back up, learn from it, and do great things with it. Or you can let it become a better of you. And that's never an option. And that day, December 30th, I thought I was one of the 25. I thought I was going to be number 24 at that time. That wasn't going to make it out. And I used to think that I was lucky. I used to think that I trained my squad so dang well that they were able to execute and do the right things for, to get me out of there. I was a fool. Because that wasn't a warrior case study. That wasn't luck. That wasn't coincidence. That's my testimony. That was God looking over for me, looking all over, over me to make sure that I made it back alive so that at some point, some place, I was able to share my story. And here I am standing in front of you sharing my testimony that God kept me alive and hoping that it reaches at least one of you. When you're out there facing adversity, when you're out back in school, when you're out back at home, when you're out back in 
work, and you're able to overcome these adversities. And when people tell you you can't, you will. When people tell you you won't, you will, and you'll show them. Thank you for what you do for my brothers and sisters that have gotten before us and coming out here and playing in honor of them. Good luck, God bless, and thank you. Good Good you. Good you. All right, guys, we have a special presentation that's going to happen, and I'm going to wrap it up with some housekeeping stuff. Let's give it up for Sergeant Major Ortega. take up too much of your time you know we're uh, getting ready to go on a football game first and foremost I just want to thank everybody here today the words of uh, inspiration everybody gave to you are truly heartfelt and to me being a Marine who served 23 years and I've been doing this for quite a long time I will tell you that I've seen a lot of great Marines I see a lot of great Marines do a lot of great things in many different climates and places and when I got an opportunity last week from my command group saying, hey, Sergeant Major, would you take the time to go out there and speak to the young football players that are going to go out there on the battlefield and go out there and come this great thing? I said, absolutely. But the first thing that came to my mind was, what was I going to tell them? And I started thinking about some things. And the one thing that came to my mind was when I was getting ready for my second deployment. And my platoon sergeant looks at me before we step on the boat, get ready to go wherever we're about to go say, you know what? Everybody wants to be in line until it's time to do the things line's supposed to do. He smirked at me, and then he followed up by saying, listen, our victories that are about to come have already been determined prior to us stepping onto that boat. And it hit me. It hit me real hard. Because I thought about all the things that he was trying to do. One, the first lesson was about attitude. As we all know, the line isn't the biggest, isn't the fastest, might not even be the smartest in the jump. But his attitude every day that he exuberates that allows him to go out there and be the king of that domain. So as you go out there today, you got to be the line. you got to have the attitude to go out there and say that that battlefield out there, that football field, that's your king. You own it. It's attitude. The second, all the stuff you did, waking up at 5, putting some PT in, getting ready for school, at practice, all the blood, sweat, tears, the accountability you held, all of you too, to make sure that they put in one more rep, they ran one second faster, that they didn't give up at the time when they fell down, that you picked them up and pushed them, that's the stuff that's gonna propel you to that victory. Because on that battlefield, that football field, that victory's already yours, because of all the hard work that you put in prior to. Fast forward my time, we came back and we were able to bring all our Marines back, which was phenomenal. A lot of us, as you already know, don't have that opportunity. And that's why we're here today. But when I think about those things, fast forward, I got a great opportunity to be a drill circuit and make many great Marines. And I remember graduating the high school and looking right on that catwalk and then turning around and seeing this nice big plaque. And I always remember, and it says, don't let no man's ghost ever say if he had only training. Think about it. Don't let no man's ghost ever say if he had only training. I'm here today with a plaque because I want to recognize a phenomenal coach who takes that seriously, who every single day will not miss on that opportunity to make sure that you're fully trained. So you never have that opportunity to say if my coach had only training. Coach Lawrence, on behalf of the United States Marine Corps, the Marine Station of San Diego, I'd like to thank you for your hard work, dedication, and all the inspiration you put into these young warriors every single day. It does not go unnoticed. And from me to you, thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Thank you. I know a lot of our coaches that served in the military, and a lot of our players came from military backgrounds. I'm saying this is for us, right? So let's go out there and play hard for this event today. Thank you guys for coming on this event. And no thanks to Nick or 
for reaching out to Rick and everybody to make sure this happens. So I appreciate that, Coach. Thank you. Thank you. I love you guys. Who's the young man? Who's the young man that's going to carry the flag through the tunnel? There's only one man I can think of carrying that flag through the tunnel. Well, it wasn't was neat. It was Jack Stahl. But it was <laughs> All right, Jack, you're going to be coming through the tunnel first. You're going to be leading your team through the tunnel. I'm going to hand you the flag, okay? Have fun with it, all right? There's going to be people taking pictures, fog, all that. Have some fun. We'll put up with your team behind you, right? And run through that tunnel when we announce you, okay? Post game, post game. What's going to happen is one of you is going to get the character winner, and one of you is going to get the MVP, all right? When that happens, just be aware that, that the media votes on the MVP, the coach chooses the character. And then at the end of the game, we will be handing this coach the 2023 Honorable Championship Trophy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, these are decals. These are decals. Coach, we ask you to put one of those on every helmet. We love seeing them on your players' helmets throughout the year. Be aware of that. At the end of the, the awards on the 50-yard line, we want the character winner, the MVP winner, and the head coach to go back to the tunnel, sign the footballs, and sign the helmets. You sign the helmets, the uh, athletes sign the football. There is also a piece of art that is there that we're going to ask you to put a screw in. That art was designed by Chief Joe here, and that piece of art will be going back to Levi Stadium and hanging in John Lynch's office because the 49ers are our presenting sponsor. We want to give them a gift for being a part of this event for six years. All right? Stand up, guys. Come in here. Get tight. Get tight. Hands up. Hands up. Hands up. Okay, the Marines of the 3-5 have a saying, and that's get some. When I say 3-5, I want you to yell, get some as loud as you can. 3-5, get, get some! Get some! Get some! Get some! Get some, guys, go! Let's go, let's go, let's go! Hope. When a service book man or woman is lost in the battlefield, it's become customary to arrange their rifle pointing downward, along with their boots and helmet. Surviving members of their squad gather around and memorialize their fallen comrades. Some of the troops will pray, others might recall personal stories. But let me make no mistake, this is a ceremony that is taken very seriously. Why? Because every soldier knows that this next ceremony might be for them. When a rifle of a man is downward into the ground, it is a memorial of a soldier killed in action. It also signals a time for a prayer, a break in the action to pay tribute to our friend and hero.
Calm down boots represent the final march of the soldiers' last battle. Placing the boots is U.S. Navy Chief Petty Officer Joe Fasano. Active duty reserve reserves, creator of the Fasano artistry. soldier's name, so he or she will never be forgotten. Placing the tags are gold star parents, gold star Tom and Patty Schumacher, honoring their son, U.S. Marine, Lance Corporal Victor Dew, 20, of Grand Bay, California. He was assigned to the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, Camp Penalty, California, and was killed in action on October 13, 2010, in the same industry. The dog tags that Patty is placing on the rifle are the actual tags that Victor wore when he was killed. Now, now ladies and gentlemen, while you're still standing, our gold star families and military members are centered on the 50 yard line. We would like to acknowledge our new fallen heroes for the tragic Osprey crash on Melville Island, Australia, during the Joint International Training in August of 2023. No family ever wants to become a gold star family, but it is a title they wear in their hearts forever. At this time, we will honor our new three heroes by remembering to say their names. I will say their name individually and will direct you when you repeat. After, we will have a moment of silence, followed by the playing of taps. Corporal Spencer R. Collar, 21, of Arlington, Virginia. Say, Spencer Collar. Captain Eleanor V. LeBeau, 29, of Belleville, Illinois. Say, Eleanor LeBeau. Major Tobin J. Lewis, 21, of Jefferson, Colorado. Say, Tobin Lewis.
on in and shake hands. Thank you so much. 